just going to put it down here and maybe it won't squeeze so much. Okay. And then you're going to have to stand on the side with my phone. Get your slide up. Hello. And first of all, I would like to thank City H International and Cherubs, the leadership, and all the members for inviting me today to present our research at Mass General Hospital. Um, what you do is really amazing in supporting each other, supporting research, and raising awareness as well. As a matter of fact, yesterday my Uber driver was picking me up right outside, and she said, uh, are you here for the big medical conference, the one on congenital diaphragmatic hernia? And I said, yes, yes, that's true. So that's one more person that, thanks to you, knows about this condition, and knows that a lot of people get together to find this and I'm going to talk hopefully, about the genetic architecture of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And uh, the one on top is our laboratory at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And Maria is our developmental biologist who is working uh, on her microscope. Right there. Uh, our study is actually quite old. Uh, our study is actually quite old. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. And uh, it was originated. It's just going in and out. Okay. Um, it was initiated by Patricia Donahoe, who's at the center here, who was a, who is a pediatric surgeon uh, in the hospital and uh, by a geneticist by the name of uh, uh, Barbara Coger, who um, started all of our study together with Megan Russell. And a lot of the people who have been in Cherubs for a long time will remember her. Uh, she started off as a study coordinator, and she, do, she did all of her PhD studies uh, in congenital diaphragmatic hernia as well in our laboratory. And this is our team right now. We have two geneticists, myself and Francis Hyde, a developmental biologist, Maria Losertales, and a whole number uh, of people that uh, work with us. They're talented, very uh, energetic and proactive. And uh, our new study coordinator as well, who will be in touch with those of you who want to participate in our study. And I will talk about some of the genetic forms of CDH. The gene discoveries that we and others have made from family studies and the gene discoveries that have been made on mouse studies and also how genetics can actually inform doctors about CDH and some of the characteristics. In particular, when I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about families here, um, I'm, I will particularly concentrate on this talk in families that have more of one affected individual, okay? And you will see how that is particularly important for gene discovery. I'm not going to give any statistics about CDH, because Don covered all of this, um, except to say that CDH is actually very common. It's about as common as cystic fibrosis, and the survival rate has been steadily increasing over the past 30 years, so that's really good news. Uh, we all know that in, at its core, CDH is the incomplete formation, or the muscularization of the developing diaphragm, and oftentimes it is associated with small lungs or lung hypoplasia. And in my talk, I will always make this contrast between isolated CDH, which is the word we use to indicate CDH alone, that's the only birth defect that's present in a, in a patient, compared to complex CDH, whereas we have CDH together with a heart defect, with a limb defect, with some kind of eye defect, and other stuff. And you can see that in the study from 2013, they actually showed that the heart develops really closely with the diaphragm. In fact, 20% of CDH patients also have a structural anomaly of the heart. And we also, of course, know that pulmonary hypertension is, is a frequent and severe complication. We think of CDH as having a multifactorial inheritance. That's all right. Um, and you see that means that different factors are, I'm gonna turn it off. Okay. Very annoying. Um, so if someone can't hear me, please let me know and I'll speak up. And also if you have any questions. Yeah, oh. 
then I'll try again. <laughs> okay. It's ours. It is ours. So, okay. my phone is off, right? Can you make turn on the phone? This, this should So, we think of CDH as a multifactorial disorder, which means that several factors are at play. There's not one single cause in many situations. And so, sex is one of them. So uh, males are usually, there's more male effect than individuals than females. We think the environment, thank you so much. We think the environment is also important. That means that, uh, you know, medicines, drugs, uh, molecules that are around us. And of course, we don't know of any one single drug that is particularly associated with CDH yet, but maybe that is some effect as well. And then stochastic factors, which means uh, it's basically a scientist li lingo to say we just don't know. It's probably chance. Chance plays a part as well. But on the top left, I added genes to this slide and put a lot of errors, arrows there because we think the genetic component is one of the most important components in the uh, formation of this, this condition. I also want to give you some evidence why we think that genetics is so important in CDH. Because we have observed that there are several families that have patients with CDH, or babies with CDH in different generations, <coughs> more than you would expect by chance. So there is a genetic component there just by looking at different families. We know that our recurrent chromosome abnormalities that are associated with CDH. And as you know, their genes are like little stretches of DNA that sits on top of chromosomes. And sometimes you can lose a whole chromosome, and sometimes you can gain a chromosome with parts of them. And sometimes you can lose little bits of chromosomes, and always the same ones are associated with the development of CDH. There are also monogenic syndromes, and these are usually associated instead of, instead of a stretch of a chromosome, just with a single gene. And if we look at my, mice, and we look at mouse strains, there are over 70 mouse strains that are associated with diaphragmatic defect. And as you know, mice are the most common animal model that we use in laboratories, to learn more about a disorder. I started, I joined MGH um, in 20, uh, 2008. So this was about the level of our understanding of the genetics of CDH at that time. But Barbara Pober, our geneticist, had published in 2005 a review that shows at the time that if we look at CDH alone, all of the individuals had no apparent genetic etiology. If we had CDH alone, we didn't know any of the genetics that contributed to that. If you had CDH with other anomalies, about 40% of them had a recognized genetic etiology, all in the, or the majority in the form of a chromosome uh, change, because those are usually changes that are larger, can be seen on a karyotype, can be seen on a microarray, and again, uh, Rebecca will talk about these different technologies in her talk. Um, but overall, not, not much was known. In the past 10 years, the improvements and the amount of knowledge that we have gained is astounding. So, um, in some of the two recent studies, they say less than 15% of cases have a non-cause, either genetic or environmental. This is really undercalling it. I think the number is much higher. In fact, um, we know for sure that about 10% of the cases are associated with chromosome abnormalities, including aneuploidies or deletion hotspots, so pieces on chromosomes that always get missing in CDH. This number is actually quoted as high as 35% in some studies. Again, I think 35% is probably too much, probably between 10 15%. And it really depends, and you'll see that a lot of these studies actually have very different numbers, which kind of make it a little confusing. And the reason that it depends a lot on the population of patients that you actually study. So um, if you are in a big hospital, more advanced hospital, you get all the more severe cases, so your numbers will go up. If you do in a pure community hospital, if you go to the territory, the, the numbers are gonna go down. And uh, Pover also realized that in complex CDH, CDH with other anomalies, it's much more likely to find a genetic variant than in isolated CDH. More recently, um, three studies have come out that have shown that maybe up to 20-25% on top of the 10% we said before actually have new mutations 
that are, do not run in the family. They are originated in the germline of the parents, and so their, their children are the first ones in the family to have a mutation. This is an example of a deletion to what I was saying. Yes. You can both sides. I can stand oh, okay. all the way back. <laughs> How about this? <laughs> Um, so this is a study that we did in 2012, and we're looking at chromosome region that's called AP23.1. And uh, as you see in A, this is the full diagram of chromosome 8. And here the bars indicate loss of genetic material in that chromosome. The reason why we separated everything in two blocks is because the upper block uh, refers to patients that have CDH alone and the lower block indicates patients that have CDH and a heart defect. So what we found in this study is that uh, patients that also have a heart defect and this genetic lesion do not have a different type of mutation than those that only have CDH. So this is another uh, situation where the genetics is not exactly predictive of what the, uh, the situation in the baby is gonna be. Even if they share the same genetic change, some patients will have a heart defect, some patients will not, we don't, we won't have it, and it's very hard to say which one is going to go on to develop a heart defect, just by genetics alone. And in this study, we also found something else that was very interesting. Uh, we found a patient that had a duplication of this region. So this patient was not missing the genetic component, it actually had more of it, and still went on to develop CDH. So this just speaks of the complexity uh, of the situation. And uh, although chromosomal anomalies are more common in complex cases, we also have to bear in mind that oftentimes chromosomal deletions such as this one is enough to have CDH alone. So if we look in general at the inheritance model of CDH, um, the recurrence risk in families has been assessed by um, looking at reported cases is around 2%, so that means that the chance of having a second affected child is about 2%. But the genetics here becomes very important because in some, with some genetic types of mutation, <coughs> this recurrent risk can, can be as high as 50%, one in two. So sometimes to know the genetics can help, can give you information for family planning and understanding these things. When we look at different families with multiple affected, we really see that uh, um, there are different modes of inheritance that are possible. Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked. All the ones that we studied in school are possible and are all associated with CDH. So it's making things even more complex. And also whenever we know the mutation, sometimes we have a situation called incomplete penetrance. Even if patients carry the mutation, they don't go on to develop CDH, and they have variable expressivity. CDH the defect can be small, can be large. But even if families are very interesting for our studies, the majority of probands that have CDH have no family history of CDH. So they're the first ones in their families to have this, um, this condition. This is an example of the de novo mutation that we have found. This is the new mutation. The parents are not carrier of the mutations. Their child is, and you see that the child is missing a little bit of DNA over there in this room called NR2F2 or PTF2. This is how the, the mutation of the variant plays out in the structure of the whole gene. And here we show that this gene is actually expressed in the developing diagram uh, in the embryonic stage in mice. Another type of inheritance is called autosomal dominance with incomplete penetrance. Uh, this is another family that we have studied um, back in 2014, actually two of them. <clears throat> and you see that in this family, each one of these signs indicates a different, a different person. And when and the, sign, the signs that are black, like the square or the circle, indicates people with CDH. You see how in this family there's four affected individuals. In this family there's three affected individuals, all of them have a mutation in the gene DSMP2 or FOC2. But what the difference is, is that there's also other individuals that carry the mutation but don't develop CDH. Again, chance plays in a little bit with this. 
and this is another type of family and type of inheritance that we have found. It's called autosomal recessive, and we'll give that a little more color some of this. But uh, what it means is that uh, um, both parents carry a variant in their DNA, and when the variant gets together in the child, then the disorder develops. Um, most of these autosomal recessive forms are actually syndromic and complex. Uh, all the pictures that I will share uh, in this uh, presentation are presenting now, they're published and publicly available, so they're, um, they're okay to show. And uh, um, some examples of these conditions are donai barrow syndrome, Matthew Wood syndrome, and SDVH plus microphthalmia, and these are the genes that are associated with them. And our laboratory worked very hard on this donai barrow syndrome here. And this is a patient that has this condition. And this study was initiated by Dr. Fantarchi in our lab. And uh, the syndrome is characterized by typical craniofacial features, like a large anterior fontanelle. And also, the facial features are, um, are peculiar to, for the syndrome. We also learned that the syndrome has ocular complications in the eye, like high myopia, so short-sightedness or near-sightedness, uh, retinal detachment, retinal dystrophy, progress progressive vision loss. And uh, other uh, features that are present in patients with donai barrow syndrome are the agenesis of the corpus callosum, which is a part of the brain that connects the left side and the right side. They have hearing loss. They have a learning disability congenital diaphragmatic hernia, of course, and umphalocele, which is an opening in the anterior part of the body. So, this syndrome was originally described in the 70s by Dr. Holmes at MGH, um, and uh, he only had a few patients, he was not able to really tie everything together, but then in the 90s, Dr. Denai and Dr. Sparrow in the UK were able to collect a large number of these, of these patients and by comparing their characteristics to actually define the syndrome and define what went along with it. And so they gave their own names to this condition. Um, in 2007, Dr. Cantarci at MGH was able to recruit some of these patients in our study, screen them for the brain defect that I mentioned before, the agenesis of the corpus callosum, screen them for the urine phenotype, and then doing genetics a type of study called the linkage analysis, was able to identify a gene that had mutations in all of these patients with donai barrow syndrome, even if they came from different parts of the world, even if they um, not, were not related to each other. And this is a diagram that shows how the protein looks like, and all the mutations that she found plotted onto the protein. Learning about a protein and how this gene is associated with the condition actually gives us a lot of information on the mechanism of the disease. So megalin, or uh, LRP2, the gene mutated in donai barrow syndrome, is a very large protein that sits on the, uh, on the membrane of the cell. And it's used to recycle materials in and out of the cell, to take nutrients and bring them in, to take molecules that are helpful for directing embryonic development into the cell so they can be used. And it's also expressed in the kidney and has a different function there as well. Um, so we think that the embryonic role is what causes the CDH, the brain defects, the eye defects in this patient, and the fact that it's expressed in the kidney is important because these, uh, also the kidney will be defective after birth. And you see that these patients lose massive amounts of protein in their urine. Normally urine would have zero protein in it. We were able to come up with, come up with a model of what actually is happening uh, in the kidney of these patients and uh, um, find ways to diagnose these patients faster and monitor their condition and the progression of their renal disease uh, before they reach end stage renal. Another group of families that we have been studying uh, more recently are these four. And uh, even just by looking at this, you notice how many males are affected, and the fact that females are not affected, but they transmit a mutation to their affected <coughs> This is what we call an X-linked type of inheritance. Um, family two, three, and four are much smaller. Family one, was quite large, 
um, and uh, it was recruited with a collaboration of Laurence Petit, who is a clinical geneticist in France. What she did was do linkage analysis, so look at different markers that are scattered throughout the full genome and see which one of these markers was associated with CDH. And she found that peaks or positive signal on chromosome X, which makes sense for an X-linked disorder, and this peak corresponds to the gene called plastin-3. So we think that plastin-3 could be very important for these families in explaining their type of CDH. Plastin-3 works in binding with actin. It has been studied for several years in models such as these. And when we looked at the actual DNA sequence of this gene, we identified variants as we expected in each one of the families. Each family had their own variant, but they were all in the same gene. Um, we did some computer analysis. We're able now to create protein models and see how they interact with each other and introduce uh, the variant that we want to study uh, in our computer model and figure out if it's possibly pathogenic. And it sounds like all the variants that we found were actually able to disrupt the protein structure. We also expressed this protein artificially in cell lines to show that these cell lines became distorted, the protein was localized in the wrong place, which gives us more confidence again that the variants that we have identified are actually positive for the condition in our families. We also found something else that we didn't expect. Many of our males that have CDH and have these mutations have increased bone density. What that means in the context of CDH, we don't know quite yet. But it's interesting to see how sometimes it's the data that leads you in one direction or another. Just observe to find something you didn't expect and then you follow up. We also looked in a mouse embryo where this protein was expressed. And sure enough, it was expressed here in the diaphragm between the liver and the heart, which are negative. And it was also expressed in the lung. This is an, um, an E13 mouse embryo. So that makes sense. <laughs> so we started working with Rick Maser, Judy Wells, and Carol Bolt at the Jackson Laboratory up in Maine. And we created a mouse strain that has the exact mutation that we found in one of our families. And interestingly enough, we were able to show that truly this variant has created the diaphragm. Change the appearance of the lungs after birth. So now, looking at all of our different families, the genetics, these changes that had been reported before, it seems like almost every family or every small group of family has a variant in a different gene, a different type of variant, chromosome variant, a mutation in a gene. And sometimes it's very hard to put things together. But we need to find an overview, a common mechanism that makes sense of all these different things that are going on. So we're working with the assistance biologist, Casper Lage, at our institution. What he does is creates protein-prone interaction networks. We put in all the proteins, all the genes that we have found over the years, and we ask the computer to come up with a model that shows which are the common mechanisms. How do you tie all these different genetics defects together? And when we do this in an unbiased way, so we don't tell the computer what to do, the computer has the data and figures it out by itself, you come up with different protein networks. So what we're hoping to do going forward is to try to connect all these different genes, all these different proteins, and maybe two, three, four different mechanisms that can be targeted independently with dedicated drugs or with dedicated intervention, although this is still uh, far down the line. This recap is a little bit of recap about the inheritance, and I prepared a few slides um, about recurrence risk, but I feel like I don't have enough time, except to tell you a little bit about this uh, study that we are um, working on and we're initiating. Um, we were very interested by the fact that identical twins that should have the exact DNA copy of each other, actually, if you look at the literature, the published literature, oftentimes they are distorted. What this means in genetic lingo is that one of them will have CDH and one will not. And um, 
this has been uh, shown and described by Kober, by Venma, by Juan over the years, so from 2005 to 2019. That is quite interesting. So something else must be at play, um, even though they have the exact same DNA. So it could be a genetic mechanism. So a mutation that one twin has and the other one doesn't. This is uncommon, but it's possible. It can be non-genetic, so chance again. Or it can be epigenetic, which is what we think. So it's not in the fact that one of the two twins has a special mutation, but its DNA is played out differently because of chemical changes around the DNA that regulate the expression of the genes and the timing of their expression. Um, we have recruited so far six twin pairs. Um, so this is something that we're going to start with. And uh, there have been some studies before that have addressed this um, the situation, although um, the results were not positive, so were not uh, clarifying. Um, one, so the two studies were from Venma and John in 2016. And what they did is they compared the DNA of one twin with the DNA of a second twin. And so is there, even though overall the DNA is 100% the same, is there some little change that happened by chance in one and not the other? And they didn't find anything. Um, one of them studied loss of uh, chromosome pieces with uh, microarray, and the other one studied point mutations in the genes, so they kind of covered all the bases. Neither of them had a lot of patients, um, probably maybe half a dozen patients for each study. So not enough to find a, a big mutation, but it doesn't seem like a genetic change is the most important thing. It's probably in the control of the genes that we can analyze the epigenetic studies. This is about um, diaphragm formation in the in the mouse and in the rat, so I'm not going to, I'm going to cover it, just take some time. But this is the last story um, of what we've done, and this is a study that has been initiated by Megan Russell, who I mentioned before. And uh, um, by studying which genes were expressed in the embryonic diaphragm of the, of the mouse, she was able to predict PBX1 as an important gene in the formation of the diaphragm. And in fact, uh, when she looked at mice that were knocked out to this gene, they did have diaphragmatic defects. Um, not exactly in the form of a hernia, but uh, in the form of uh, abnormal muscularization. And a few years later, her hypothesis has been confirmed, uh, and uh, patients with PBX1 mutations have been reported in the literature, have been identified. So in this case, instead of going from the human to then create the mouse, we went from the mouse data, and then once we knew about this gene, we were able to find And uh, more recently, Dr. McCauley picked up the study of this PBX knockout mouse, and he realized that uh, these PBX mice, uh, as published in the journal of Clinical Investigation, had cardiac hypertrophy, right atrial enlargement, and several signs of uh, pulmonary hypertension. So now he has a model where he can test drugs and mechanisms to better understand the development of uh, pulmonary hypertension in these children. So I've covered almost 20 years of study. So <laughs> I understand if you are very confused by this, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how we can use human and then create mouse models that inform us on the disease mechanisms, or sometimes we can start from humans and from families, and then I create mice and go full circle. And there's many, many people that have been involved in all of these studies. Uh, Dr. Donahoe, who literally uh, started the project uh, at Mass General Hospital. And recently we've been collaborating very closely with Columbia University. Some of the data that I presented um, includes patients from Wen Chung and Dr. Yu Meng Shen as well. <coughs> and all the surgeons, of course, at MGH and Boston Children's Hospital have been invaluable in finding all these patients and engaging them in our study and recruiting them in our study so that we can work together and many other different institutions, including the Jackson Laboratory, particularly for modeling all of our variants in months. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully I haven't confused you too much. <laughs>
have any questions tomorrow? Okay. Um, I'll start here and go this way. Yes. So in one of the early slides, you had a statistic about less than 15% are linked to genetic or environmental factors. What are, are there some key environmental factors that have been linked to CDH? Um, there, there have, many have been proposed <coughs> over the years, um, but I don't think any of them have the strength of evidence that really makes them very convincing. Um, so I, I think more epidemiological data needs to be collected um, before, and I think the University of Utah is actually working on this. Um, I think they hired um, an epidemiologist to collect data of incidence of CDH in different parts of the state to, to figure out the connection. Yes? Um, do you know any type of study that's involved in the Excuse me? Milas. Milas. Oh, Milas. Um, I know that uh, some of the proteins that have, are involved in CDH have been connected to um, mitochondrial metabolism particularly the LRP2 gene that I showed before for the Naibero syndrome. Uh, but the function of LRP2 in the mitochondrion is not very well known at this point. But I, I see where you come from, muscle, muscle differentiation as well as um, energy usage. Um, but I, I don't think the association is very strong. So the region that I showed actually does not overlap that gene. Okay. So it's the same chromosome. You imagine a chromosome is very big and has several hundreds of thousands of genes. So this particular region that is deleted is a bit more to the end of the short arm. So it's in a different region. Um, I'm not familiar with your case, although I worked with Dr. Hai. So um, I know that, again, a lot of times we find very different conditions all are associated with CDH. A phenotype that goes across different conditions, across different mechanisms, makes it very hard to model in this study. So this is why we're using this approach, we're using also computer-based analysis to put it together. Because instead of studying 2,000 different conditions, then maybe we can make sense and study four or five different conditions that are related to each other. It'd be nice to work with that particular gene and see how it ties in with the different pathways. Yes? With, with your study, are you using samples from the actual patient or are you using the parents' samples? Well, in our study, we, re we collect samples from parents, from patients, and sometimes from family members as well. So if there's a family history for CDH, we may engage also different generations, cousins, aunts, grandparents, um, so that we can do linkage analysis. So looking at different markers across the DNA, find out which part of which chromosome um, moves along with the disease and is connected to the disease. So we do collect, certainly if possible, from both parents as well as the patient, and sometimes from a larger. Um, Would you be able to? Like my, my son's passed away. Uh, do you guys do just parental studies? We don't do just parental studies, but in these situations, sometimes we connect with the pathology department. If uh, I post more than a photo in the family is done, we're able to retrieve DNA from paraffin blocks or autopsy specimens that were collected during the genetic analysis. Yeah. Uh, with the
So I presented two studies that have done this. Uh, one is based in China, one is based, I think, in Europe, and they, they've done this comparison between the two twins. Um, I don't think either study has really found an answer quite yet uh, about what the difference is between the twins. Um, we are thinking of starting something along the same lines so looking at the genetic changes, but we haven't started yet, so I cannot give you an answer what I think will turn out. Um, the issue with this is that CDH so variable, it's very hard to find two different people with the same genetic cause, and if you add you know, twins that are discordant, so that makes this, the, these are very rare occurrences. So we really need to build a group of samples that are large enough before, before this is done. And I think uh, it's better to move on to the next speaker or? Yeah. yeah. But I'll be around, so if you have other questions. Yeah. If we want to talk about enrollment, how do we enroll in your? I we, don't enroll, We will but make sure that you all have more information if you have questions or you want to be a part of study and also with dreams and they share samples and yeah. it's important that you enroll in every, every possible study. research study. Even though we work together, we may not do the exact same thing. So we always encourage people that are interested to enroll in both studies. And uh, um, Jennifer Liu, who is uh, our genetic counselor uh, and uh, our study coordinator, actually gave me a number of informational uh, forms. There. Yes, we'll put those on the table. Um, so who is interested, she can give it a call and she'll tell you about it. And for talk more about this study as well. And for the people on Facebook who are listening, um, that we will post that as well on our page so that you can get in touch with Moro. Thank you. Thank you.